afternoon. Welcome to our second town hall series. We are delighted to have you with us today. I'm Mary McGowan, CEO of FSR. A quick bit of housekeeping. If you would like to view this session with all of the participants, click on the dotted grid at the top of your page and select gallery view. You will be muted throughout today's town hall, but we will be answering questions from the community. FSR conducted a survey on steroids and sarcoidosis and gathered questions from the community at that time and ATIRE Pharma solicited questions on social media channels. We will be addressing these questions throughout the session. Your chat will be turned off. As we wrap up Sarcoidosis Awareness Month, we want to thank all of you for joining us for our wellness and support programs. Please visit the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research's YouTube channel, where you can find recordings of the educational programs, such as this one, that have taken place during April and throughout the year. And thank you so much to all of you who participated in our inaugural Steps for Sark virtual endurance and fundraising campaign. Amazingly, we have walked 6,249 miles in 30 days. And as a community, we raised over $43,000 for FSR research and support, all while raising awareness about sarcoidosis. April is Sarcoidosis Awareness Month, but of course, every month is Sarcoidosis Awareness Month at FSR. Thank you to our sponsors who made this year's Sarcoidosis Awareness Month possible, including Beringer Engelheim and Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals. If you enjoyed the events this month and are interested in learning more about the latest sarcoidosis research, please be sure to visit our website at stopsarcoidosis.org and click on the Join Our Community button. Please also join us June 12 through 13 for our virtual patient summit to have the opportunity to speak with leading global experts in sarcoidosis and chronic illness management and to connect up with your fellow SARC warriors. We would also like to invite you to join us for this year's virtual summit, uh, which will be taking place June 12 through 13. FSR is excited to share that this year's summit will have increased networking opportunities an exciting multidisciplinary Q&A session with world leaders in sarcoidosis and tracks for those to sarcoidosis community and for those who are living with a chronic condition and condition-based session to optimize your learnings. To learn more, please visit stopsarcoidosis.org. We would like to extend a special thank you to Atire Pharma for collaborating with us on this important and timely discussion today on steroids and sarcoidosis. Without further ado, I am pleased to introduce our moderator for today's program. John Carlin is an award-winning news anchor currently working at WSLS 10 in Roanoke, Virginia. He is the host of the bi-weekly SARC Fighter podcast. He is an FSR patient advocate and member of FSR's patient advisory committee. John is also an avid cyclist, a strong pillar of his local community, a loving husband, father and grandfather, and a sarcoidosis warrior. John, I'll turn it over to you and thank you so much for moderating today's panel. Thank you, Mary. It's really a pleasure to be here and I'm very excited to be uh, talking about steroids and uh, prednisone and uh, how it's sort of a, a situation that is, is good on one hand, but challenging on the other. And we'll be talking about that throughout our program here today with our panelists. And let me just say a couple of other things about, uh, about prednisone. Of course, uh, thanks to their anti-inflammatory qualities, steroids or uh, corticosteroids have been a first-line treatment for those who live with sarcoidosis. And FSR actually conducted a survey to learn about the sarcoidosis community's experience with steroids. And that survey shows that 98% of us, myself included, living with steroids have been, uh, uh, living with sarcoidosis have been prescribed steroids at some point. In addition, we learned that nearly 55% of people experienced insomnia, check, <laughs> right? Uh, we also saw that nearly 50% had mood swings or irritability, check. Just a quick aside on that, at work, they started calling me Honest John because I had no filter. I just started telling everybody what I thought, and sometimes that wasn't appropriate. But And, and then the, the irritability, I don't know how I'm still married. My wife is a saint, 
Uh, but so that's something that we'll be talking about today. Uh, and then a lot of people had severe weight gain, check, and over 30% had increased blood sugar or developed diabetes, among other symptoms. And that is, uh, that is not something that, that I personally suffered with, but we'll be hearing from some, some people who have. And so we have a great panel put together today to really look at this from the medical perspective, from the patient perspective, and from the research perspective as well. And I want to start now by introducing Jessica Reed, who uh, came to be a proud sarcoidosis patient navigator by way of experience, not only an 18-year neurosarcoidosis survivor, but also a registered nurse and recent family nurse practitioner graduate. Congratulations. She, uh, just as she um, refused to allow neurosarcoidosis to stop her from obtaining her bachelor and master of science in nursing degrees, Jessica now aspires to persevere and achieve her doctor of nursing practice, her DNP, within the next five years. Very ambitious. And Jessica, why don't you uh, take a couple of minutes and share your story with us? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. And thank you, John, for that nice introduction. My name is Jessica Reed, and I've been fighting neurosarcoidosis for 18 years now. And throughout those 18 years, I've been on daily medications, including prednisone, more than once. My doctor first prescribed prednisone when neurosarcoidosis was confirmed in my spine. I was given a low dose of prednisone, and I only dealt with weight gain and irritability as side effects. However, years later, the neurosarcoid caused severe brain inflammation, and as a result, I suffered from grand mal seizures. This is when I was prescribed a high dose of 60 milligrams of prednisone daily for two years. The list of side effects I experienced during that time were weight gain of more than 80 pounds, stomach bloating, moon face, humpback, insomnia, depression, mood swings, loss of bone density, fluid retention in my legs, increased sweating, skin thinning, hair loss, stretch marks, and vision changes. After being on such a high dosage for two years, my neurologist and I mutually agreed on a treatment plan to slowly taper me off prednisone, and he replaced it with Celsipt. Since 2007, 2007, I take Celsipt and Keppra daily and will indefinitely per my neurologist. It is important to note here that when sarcoid symptoms affect your quality of life and well-being, taking prednisone can be a game changer, but there's a catch. Prednisone is known for a host of side effects that range from annoying to intolerable. And for that, steroid alternatives are vitally important to me for two reasons. One, in the words of a dear friend and fellow FSR patient navigator, we are forced to make a terrible decision, either live with prednisone side effects and damage or live with the sarcoidosis symptoms and damage. We need more treatment options. Prednisone being the automatic go-to is not enough. And number two, prednisone causes more harm than good. Taking prednisone for an extended time often leads to more problems such as diabetes, adrenal insufficiency, and acid reflux. So not only are we taking medications for sarcoidosis, but also for the additional diagnoses that prednisone causes, possibly for a lifetime. All right, Jessica, your pictures uh, say it all as, as well as your words, and uh, you're looking great these days for sure. So, so congratulations for having uh, navigated all of that. Next, I want to introduce our next panelist. Dr. Elliot Krauser is the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research's Scientific uh, Advisory Board Chair. He has over 31 years of medical experience. He's also a professor of medicine at Ohio State, where he specializes in pulmonary and critical care medicine, with a focus on translational research on systemic inflammatory diseases involving the lungs. He has contributed to the publication of more than 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts and served as the president of the American Association of Sarcoidosis and Other uh, granul Granulomatous Disorders, better known as ASOG, uh, and that was from 2017 to 2019. Dr. Krauser, um, please unmute yourself and tell us a little bit more about you and, and what you'd like to discuss today. 
Thanks, John, for that nice introduction. Um, and to Jessica for describing so vividly, you know, all the complications of taking steroids. And I almost feel like hiding under my desk right now because for the last 31 years or more, I've been prescribing, you know, steroids for all kinds of inflammatory conditions. But I have very much focused on sarcoidosis <clears throat> since uh, 1998 when I created a specialty clinic for those patients. And uh, I got to know them and I got to know the drug treatments and all the bad adverse effects of those. And I spent a lot of my career, including through support of the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research, seeking alternative treatment options to uh, reduce the, the effects of the steroids, which as Jessica and John were saying, very effective for anti-inflammatory uh, indications, but, but you're, you're, you've created new diseases. You know, it basically cre it creates a, 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 a situation where you, you choose your poison, right, Jessica? So um, I think that's gonna be the theme today. And that's why I rose my, raised my hand when they asked me to, 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 because I believe this is a very important critical topic uh, for sarcoidosis patients. All right, Dr. Krauser, thank you. And we're looking, uh, looking forward to hearing more about what you have to say. And hopefully you don't feel too guilty by the end of this uh, for having prescribed this. Uh, so many times, but uh, we know it, it's a necessary evil at, at some point. But the idea here is is we want to find a, a reason for hope and maybe some something else that you can prescribe down the road. And speaking of that, uh, our next panelist is uh, Dr. Sanjay Shukla. Uh, he's president and chief executive officer of ATAR Pharma, uh, where he also serves on the board of directors since November of 2017. Prior to joining ATAR Pharma, Dr. Shukla served as Vice President and Global Head of Integrated Medical Services for Novartis, a biopharmaceutical company where he led global medical efforts operations with oversight for uh, all pharma general medicine uh, therapies, both in line and in development. And Dr. Shukla received his MD from Howard University College of Medicine and his Bachelor's of Science in Microbiology and Master of Science in Epidemiology and biostatistics from the University of Maryland. And Dr. Shukla, you are now working on a drug that may be something that uh, will spare a lot of these uh, uh, patients who are dealing with the prednisone. Please please uh, talk a little bit more about uh, your, your area of conversation today. Sure, John, <clears throat> and thank you for the FSR for the, uh, the invitation uh, to talk about this very important topic. Um, I myself am a drug development physician. I've been uh, in industry for about 25 years. Uh, always been drawn to uh, challenging medical conditions, uh, rare diseases, uh, and essentially areas where we just need better medicines. Uh, sarcoidosis was uh, a condition uh, that I first learned about uh, really as a medical student uh, in Washington, D.C. at Howard. Uh, began to um, really understand how much we don't know about sarcoidosis um, at that time. Uh, while at ATIRE, uh, I saw an opportunity for us to potentially look at one of our therapies uh, in sarcoidosis. Uh, but as I've uh, mentioned to many of you before, I really believe it's a disease that uh, we just have to do better. We have to understand it better. Uh, we have to uh, have better treatment options. And we really need to understand what the patient journey and what they go through uh, a lot better. Uh, I think we've done some of that over the last four or five years at ATIRE, and we've cultivated a therapy uh, that I think um, uh, has some promise. Uh, as, I, as I like to say, um, no one therapy is perhaps cure-all. Um, I'm looking to create something that can be added to the toolkit so experts like Dr. Krauser have more options. I think options is where the first thing uh, we, we really need to focus on. Um, I can talk a little bit about ATIRE now or later. I know the slides are up, um, uh, but, but I can just give you a high level overview. Uh, we work on a new area of biology coming out of the Scripps Institute uh, in La Jolla, California. Uh, we're based in San Diego. Uh, this uh, biology is really uh, a, a untapped area of immunology. Uh, our founder, Dr. Paul Schimmel, uh, discovered that we have enzymes in our bodies uh, that do something very different uh, than a normal than their normal function, which is to help us make proteins. These enzymes are called tRNA synthetases. 
What he discovered is fragments of these enzymes migrate out into different uh, tissue systems, and there they play a very different role. They help control inflammation. So our job is to really take these discoveries and try to create new therapies. I'll point you to this slide on the left where ATYR 1923 is the most relevant uh, to this discussion. Uh, it's a novel immunomodulator for severe inflammatory lung diseases. We have picked pulmonary sarcoidosis as the first indication where we think we have the best chance of demonstrating effects. Um, and we are expecting data uh, right up here in, in the third quarter of 2021. Uh, so very excited uh, to reveal some of this data. Um, if you go to the next slide, highlights a little bit of our pipeline, We're very, very much focused on interstitial lung disease. Uh, the top of the chart there, our program 1923, uh, also holds promise, I think, in other interstitial lung diseases. Um, we also learned quite a bit about uh, these enzyme fragments uh, some of which we thought we think might lead us to discoveries also in cancer. If we move to the next slide, uh, it talks a little bit about, it summarizes our, our therapy. Uh, 1923 is a protein therapeutic. Uh, we have seen uh, its ability to downregulate inflammation uh, and really uh, prevent some of the inflammation and uh, fibrotic change that uh, many patients uh, have to deal with. Uh, we've seen that in, in animals. Uh, we've also discovered that it binds to a receptor that is highly expressed in the granulomas of sarcoidosis patients. So uh, it fits rather nicely that uh, the target of our drug is actually seen um, uh, quite robustly in, in the granulomas, uh, which of course are uh, the really bad tissue that um, uh, patients have to deal with, in particular in their lungs. Uh, this is a drug that's administered once a month through a one hour IV infusion. Uh, we think that's better than taking uh, medication every day. And I think the last point is really the, the thing I want to drive home here. It's really well tolerated thus far in patients and subjects. Tolerability, eliminating steroid, uh, the toxic effects of steroids was always in the back of my mind when we developed this therapy. I uh, just want to quickly jump forward uh, and then outline that we've uh, uh, enrolled 37 sarcoidosis patients across the U.S. in this trial. We're testing a number of doses with our therapy. Uh, and as I said, we expect this data to uh, be revealed in the uh, third quarter this year. One of the key endpoints is a steroid sparing effect. Uh, that's what we are, are really looking to uh, observe here. It's what I think is one of the most clinically meaningful endpoints, not only to experts, but also to patients. Uh, and I think the last slide just highlights uh, that it's a six-month trial, and we are, in fact, trying to taper people down on steroids in our trial. And then we want to be able to see if our drug can essentially replace uh, steroids. Um, Long-term, I would love this therapy to be something that, as I said, can be part of the toolkit that uh, experts can use. And maybe instead of reaching for steroids, uh, perhaps uh, ATYR 1923 can be a better and safer alternative. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. And uh, thanks for allowing me to present a, a little bit of our slides. Right. And you'll know more about that in the third quarter of this year, correct? That's when you anticipate being able to report some, some data from your clinical trials? Correct. We're in the, the, the last stages here of a multi-year process where we uh, enrolled, uh, as I said, 37 sarcoidosis patients. Um, about two-thirds of those uh, receive our drug and one-third receive placebo. Uh, and these are important phase two results. Uh, if positive, it will allow us to potentially move into a, uh, a registrational trial, which would be conducted worldwide. But right now, this is a trial uh, that will read out here in the third quarter. So um, uh, we, we are um, uh, really anticipating these important findings. All right, very good. And I've got, we've got lots of questions about why it's so hard for for companies to work on these steroid sparing drugs, but I want to I want to move on a little bit because let's let's focus back on prednisone and Jessica. I want to go to you here. Um, we looked at your pictures, you shared your story, and uh, among all the things that prednisone did to you, uh, it, I, if you can choose, what would you say were the worst things? Physically, I would say, John, it was the weight gain. Um, I went from a size eight to a size 18. 
And of course I had to change, I had to buy new clothes. I had to completely change my wardrobe, which was very costly. And um, the stomach bloating, I was due to those two side effects. I didn't wanna go out in public. I would actually see high school classmates in public and they did not recognize who I was. I had just, of course you saw from the pictures, I changed drastically. And during that time, my daughter was five years old. She was just beginning school. And I was embarrassed to even be involved in her school activities, including her field trips. And I know she needed me, of course, but I just, I was ashamed. Um, mentally, the mood swings. Besides my daughter being five years old, I also had a son who was three months old at that time. And I had to have my family step in to help me care for my children um, because it became very difficult. There were times when I simply didn't know how I felt that day. I didn't know if I was irritable, didn't know if I was depressed and had to sort through all those feelings. And my family did not want to be around me. It was hard to explain. And it was sad. It was very, very sad having to pull away from my family members whom I needed and who also needed me. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a lot of people watching today. And uh, although I, I can't see them, uh, I know a lot of people have to be nodding their heads and saying, yep, that was me. That was me. That was me. Uh, because it really, uh, I wouldn't have recognized you from those pictures. So, um, and then did, were you in, in any pain from any of that? I don't recall any pain because of the neurological damage I experienced. I had more so weakness and, um, muscle atrophy in my right, right leg. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I had a lot of atrophy myself. I just, you know, I couldn't even, you know, pick up my infant grandkids and carry them to the car without it feeling like it was a strain. And, and these were, you know, just, just small children, but it just, you just lose your strength. I want to move on and, and I want to bring in Dr. Krauser now uh, as well. Um, and, and then Jessica, maybe you could dovetail off the back of him, but um, you know, when we look at the, I mean, it's not just inconvenient the the effects of prednisone there there can be some we looked at the short term but there are also some long term effects from prednisone Dr Krauser could you comment on what you watch for and what your big concern is if somebody stays on prednisone for too long Well first of all let me um, emphasize that I try to minimize the exposure of steroids to my patients you know I try to get them on the lowest possible dose. I try to use other drugs that are currently available, some of which are not very well tolerated, but we do it anyway, uh, to try to reduce the exposure to the steroids because there are so many, as we've talked about uh, thus far, but there's some others too. Uh, for instance, there was a meta-analysis recently published in Close Medicine, which is a high-end journal of the complications, cardiovascular complications. These are serious cardiovascular complications you know, atrial fibrillation, myocardial infarction, death, you know, uh, these kind of things. So, um, and they did, and I was a little surprised because I thought when I got people down to five milligrams or equivalent of prednisone a day that I had achieved something good, you know, uh, that now it's safe. But that, that um, article indicated that even at doses of prednisone chronically at five milligrams a day or, or less, you are at higher risk of these very serious complications. And of course, there are other people that can't tolerate it because of mood. There are other people that develop a vascular necrosis of their hips. I have one patient who's had bilateral hip replacements uh, because of uh, a vascular necrosis of the hip. Cataracts is common. Uh, we talked about diabetes. I have people that become obese and now they have sleep apnea and, and hypertension. So you, you're trading off one disease for another when you use prednisone in, in, in excess. That being said, sometimes you have to use it to some degree. When I use it, I also do avoid using it every day. So I'll do every other day dosing. I don't know if you were exposed to this, but one of the problems is trying to get people back off of it once they're on them. Uh, if you're on, it, on a daily dose of prednisone, it could be very difficult to wean it off. Your body just can't tolerate it because your body normally makes steroids. Uh, the adrenal glands make steroids. If you're on prednisone every day, your, your adrenal glands sh shut down and shrink. 
and they can no longer make these vital steroids, which keep your blood pressure up and do all kinds of other things. Uh, so if you, you can actually have a, a life-threatening withdrawal from steroids if you stop them abruptly, if you've been on them every day like that. So there, there are lots of, uh, lots of issues with chronic steroid use, and that's why we're having this important conversation today. And, and that's my, my clinical practice. If somebody comes to see me, I'm specialized. And one of my most important accomplishments is to fold in these other medications for those that need chronic treatment. The other thing I'll mention too, is that I, I, you gotta be careful about you know, finding, there are some treatment, some people that absolutely need treatment, right? The, you don't want neurologic complications to become permanent. <clears throat> Likewise, if your heart is involved, you don't want that to become a permanent, you know, you can develop heart failure, uh, fatal arrhythmias potentially. And uh, some of those are actually uh, mitigated by using these anti-inflammatory drugs, including the steroids. So uh, they are essential uh, in some cases, in some patients, uh, but you have to be very aware of the risks and then you gotta do your best, to get, the, the, get them on the lowest, the available possible well-tolerated dose and use other medications available. And uh, hopefully there will be new ones that will come along too that would uh, allow us a lot more uh, options because every person is different as to what, you know, the side effects of any drug. Uh, so we like, we'd like to have a, an array of different choices uh, as an option to replace them. All right. Uh, Jessica, if you would, um, did, do you have any long-term effects that are left over from your days with prednisone? Yes. Um, two in particular are um, depression. I now take Wellbutrin. And I've actually had to experiment. My um, provider had to experiment with myself on the right dosage. Um, because, of course, as a woman, I have hormones. So certain times of the month, I would need it more than others. And um, secondly, I now have some bone loss in my hip as Dr. Krauser uh, was speaking to. I now go to physical therapy once a week. And that's gonna take three months right now just to see how it's going to help me because I wanna prolong the surgery. I don't wanna go into that surgery. You know, I'm 40 years old. It's a very expensive and a very uh, crucial surgery to bounce back from. So the bone loss, um, once again, as a woman, losing the estrogen. I'm at 40 years old and that's going to take place, of course, with the hormone changes. So I have to keep an eye on these things, of course, um, to be sure I don't have any bone fractures, you know, any breaks of things of that sort. So the depression and the bone loss density are two that I'm still dealing with to this day. All right. And um, Dr. Shukla, I want to ask you, because um, when we were uh, talking earlier, uh, you had mentioned something about um, if prednisone, which I guess has been around since the 1950s, if, and you're an expert in bringing drugs to market, what would happen today if someone just popped up with prednisone and said, hey, here's a thing, let's start giving it to people. What, what would be the process? What, what would people, uh, what would happen? Probably be quickly labeled a poison. You know, you'd probably see some things in animals and uh, that'd be the end of it. Um, there would be no way that you would, uh, you can see effects in animals. So in no way would any uh, rational drug development expert then say, well, let's just give this to human beings now because of that long list of side effects. So for 50 years in, in many ways, um, and I don't think it's too strong of a word, we've been administering a poison um, to, as a risk benefit to you know, to, to patients, not only in sarcoidosis, but for a number of conditions. Uh, but absolutely, 50 years ago, uh, it wouldn't see uh, daylight in, in any, any, any kind of human setting. And as I said, I think it'd be quickly labeled a poison. I think Jessica um, saying it's annoying and intolerable, that's really being kind for a poison. <laughs> right. You, uh, uh, so let's say uh, we're, we're watching uh, morning television and the pharmaceutical commercial comes on and they're trying to get you to ask your doctor to give you XYZ drug. And then the person starts reading about the side effects while they're flying a kite. 
But how, how does that look to you? How, how would that look? That's a long, that's a documentary. That's not, you, you're going to have to, you're going to have to buy a longer slot because even if that guy that they always get who speaks real quickly, um, they, he's going to be talking. I mean, I, it's, it's not funny actually, but you know, the, the, these, these things, uh, that laundry list of problems and, and Dr. Krauser even highlights some of the, the increased risk here. So there's one thing to, to live with the day-to-day -day burden of the, the weight gain, the insomnia, some of these uh, irritability things we talk about, but then the increase in risk for the other kinds of comorbidities that you may develop, uh, that's something that you know is, is not really a, uh, a choice that patients should have to make. Uh, and I think you know, even from the industry side, um, we have to do better. We have to understand that this is just not good enough. Um, and I, I'm, I would predict in the future generations of scientists, I don't know when, will look back at this era of using prednisone and, and uh, similar to maybe some of the uh, you know, snake oil stuff that was used in the 1800s where people would go to different uh, cities and towns. They will talk about prednisone in the medical uh, in textbooks in, in a similar manner. So this is like the great Dr. Kilmer's swamp root kidney, liver, and bladder cure, <laughs> snake oil. <laughs> I once I once found a, this old bottle, and that's literally what it said on, and it had a, like a cork stopper, and it was it was that that's what you think we'll be comparing prednisone to. I, I would I would first of all I would hope so because I think by then we'll have better treatment options, and and I, I really believe that um, uh, prednisone needs. Is, Steroids have their place, don't get me wrong. I think in a acute setting, there's a number of conditions where uh, they can be helpful, but uh, I am always, um, I'm asked quite a bit, uh, maybe sometimes even weekly that, you know, how bad are they? And um, I, I think another problem we have is we have a um, disjointed view of steroids because there's this view that, well, they're cheap. So I think that is another problem we have that, um, uh, this, this cheap and readily available concept, even sometimes with, with doctors, uh, not experts like Dr. Krauser, but sometimes docs look at it and say, well, this will just be fine. Um, I, I, think, I think we've all got to be better than cheap, uh, cheap poison, right? Yeah, for sure. So, so Dr. Krauser, if somebody is on, like, for instance, I have neurosarc and it's actually on my spinal cord, and anytime I have a flare, it does additional damage, which is cutting off signal to the lower part of my body. So um, my doctors felt like the only way we know we can get this stopped is with prednisone. So, and I'm sure that there are a number of people listening right now who are in that same boat in their, in their heart or cardio, you know, whatever. Um, how, um, how can you combat the prednisone while you're taking it? What can you do? Are there foods you can eat? Or is there exercise you can do? Is there, can you drink more water? How do you, how do you sort of combat those side effects? Well, first of all, you're, you're going to have this will to eat and, it, and you can't stop that. You can't suppress it, but you can mitigate it to some degree by eating things that are not too rich in, in calories. And by exercising, which is a suppressor of appetite by in and of itself. Uh, so I do, I talk to my patients about exercise. It also helps build up bone strength. And we talked about muscle strength. Some of the, my patients think I'm, when I'm going to give them steroids, they're going to get stronger, you know, like, a, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, but uh, no, it melts away your muscles as you, you were talking about before. So yeah, exercise. Uh, there are some diets that are, I think this is very preliminary evidence that they might, uh, flavonoid enriched diet might have a beneficial effect in terms of uh, increasing the anti-inflammatory actions of the steroids, but that's very preliminary. I, I don't think there's a diet per se that is, is better, but I, I would say that uh, since the cardiovascular risk is increased among people that take steroids, I would I would argue that it would be make sense to uh, you know follow your cholesterol levels and triglycerides and watch your weight and uh, eat 
properly as you would for a heart smart kind of diet. All right. Um, Mary, I want to bring you into this conversation a little bit as the CEO of FSR, because I know you're watching all of these dynamics at a high level. And you, Jessica has been so um, uh, helpful in terms of explaining the patient perspective, and we're looking at the difficult decisions the doctors have to make. How is FSR trying to guide solutions to all of this? Yeah, thank you, John. Um for that question. Um, so this is a, a very uh, serious concern for uh, FSR. Uh, we feel that we can do much better uh, for patients uh, living with sarcoidosis, um, and uh, we are trying to move the needle on this. Um, we've actually been uh, talking to the FDA. I did a, a statement uh, this year uh, during a Rare Disease Day um, at FDA um, and you know, really talking with them and promoting accelerating research in sarcoidosis um, and just pointing out how critically important it is for the FDA to partner with researchers and pharmaceutical companies to identify and expand um, opportunities for, um, you know, surrogate intermediate clinical endpoints and for, um, you know, just making sure that we are out there um, with uh, a voice, um, just really trying to get better treatments for sarcoidosis patients. Um, we also have been uh, talking uh, with the NIH about increasing funding uh, for uh, research and as well as working with many, many uh, coalitions now, uh, and not just uh, nationwide, but actually international coalitions that uh, FSR has joined, but really collaborating uh, with uh, those um, in uh, the nation uh, to uh, write letters to Congress and to make sure that our voice is being heard uh, for support of better treatments and more money for research uh, and uh, working, as I said, with researchers and pharmaceutical companies uh, to uh, expand this uh, really much needed uh, opportunity. Um, and uh, and we, we have to do better. Our nation can do better. We have to do better for patients. Right. And well, one of the things that I've heard over and over on the Sark Fighter podcast, when, when people come on and tell their stories, is that they really have a hard time finding a doctor who knows anything about sarcoidosis. Um, it's, it's really tough. And I know that FSR is doing what it can, but maybe you could talk about that just briefly, reaching out to medical schools and trying to get more uh, of the upcoming medical generation up to speed on sarcoidosis and, and working not just on research, but just on patient treatment. Yeah, absolutely. So for those who may who are listening today who may not know, uh, we do have a, a physician uh, directory where we can... Um, uh, you know, put patients in touch with physician, physicians, um, and also our uh, Wausau FSR centers of excellence. Um, obviously, those are opportunities as well to connect with uh, physicians. But to your point, John, uh, with regards to young researchers and uh, young physicians, uh, this is one of the primary uh, points of our research program uh, where we fund uh, fellowships and we fund young researchers and we fund uh, pilot projects uh, to really help us gain a better understanding of sarcoidosis and of course to move the needle. Uh, and we believe very strongly in bringing in the young uh, medical community uh, into the sarcoidosis space because that is the future for sarcoidosis, is to really be uh, working with these young researchers to support them financially uh, how we can, and not just financially, but in other ways to support the research that they're doing. So again, this is a real uh, important mission for FSR and something that we spend a lot of time and, and, and resources uh, to support uh, these young researchers and doctors. Right. So we look at uh, sarcoidosis in the United States, and there are uh, at any given time about 200,000 patients, which qualifies sarcoidosis as an orphan disease or a rare disease. And there are thousands of orphan and rare diseases out there. Uh, and so, uh, Dr. Shukla, I'm, I'm curious, and I'm sure people want to know, uh, how does a pharmaceutical company, if you know, if you come up with a cure for breast cancer, 
you know, you're, you're working on something that affects millions of people. So how does a pharmaceutical company come at this and, and say, sarcoidosis is what I want to try and find a cure for? And how do you make that work? And, and why don't more people do it? Or is it almost impossible for people to do it, companies? Well, <clears throat> it's, it's, certainly a, um, it's certainly a problem. Uh, I, I think um, having been involved in rare disease um, research for most of my career, uh, the trade-off that companies have to make embarking into a, an area where there is, you know, maybe not everything understood from a disease point of view, uh, natural history, what's the cause, um, what, what, are the, what are the patients really going through? So that awareness is not there, first of all. So you've got to spend a lot of time really understanding uh, that. But the, the sort of sad truth here is sometimes larger companies make decisions also based on um, a commercial opportunity. So sometimes uh, things that have promise will be um, uh, shepherded towards areas where there's the largest commercial opportunity. Um, I think this is also a problem that industry has where even our therapy, I can tell you early on, and we're a public company, uh, I'm sure there would be um, uh, plenty of folks uh, relieved and excited if I said, well, the drug will work in IPF. So I'll, I'll say this um, with, with, with uh, um, you know, the, 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 the idea here is IPF is a well-known disease better known than sarcoidosis, larger opportunity, two drugs already generate about $3 billion in revenue. So there's modeling and an understanding that you can do. The problem is if the biology of your drug doesn't fit and the evidence does not match what that, that disease might require, in that case, highly fibrotic, it's different. Dr. Krauser knows a lot more about it than I do. The point being, we need to basically look at our therapies and say, where does this make the most sense? And I understand that in the drug industry, it's a commercial industry, but too many decisions I think sometimes are made early on to shoehorn opportunities into um, those sort of more richer commercial environments. We've got to get back to basics and maybe I'm just a naive physician scientist here, but what does the evidence tell you? Where might this, 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 this potential therapeutic be most useful? And um, diseases like diabetes and hypertension and heart disease, the big conditions have been taken care of uh, by a lot of the pharma industry. I, I spent a lot of time in large companies, but, sure. but I think we really need to focus on the rare disease uh, uh, opportunities. Well, it's a risk reward thing for the pharmaceutical company. I, I, I'm sure that there's millions and millions of dollars uh, that you guys have already invested in a drug and you don't know if it's going to work coming out the other side of your clinical trials. It looks promising and that's good. But, you know, at any given point, you jump in the river and you go down the river and you hope that your boat stays there and doesn't get pushed ashore at some point and, and the project is over and all those millions of dollars that you risked are, are were for naught. So what can anybody do, government or otherwise, to create a funding path uh, or other incentives for companies like ATIRE to, to go after rare disease treatments to help develop them? I think it starts with what some of what we're doing today, disease awareness. We've got to understand the disease better. We have gotten better in a lot of rare diseases, but even sarcoidosis, we're still learning about what's the causative agent, things, things like that. Secondly, I think awareness of what the patient's burden and 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 we're talking about steroids, again, we're equating it to a poison. We have to do a lot better to improve the quality of life of patients. And now biotech and biopharma is really about, you know, those targeted areas, you know, what, what is really happening in sarcoidosis with a patient? How do we create better drugs with better outcomes? And then I think the last piece is really highlighting, frankly, the economic burden to the healthcare system. We talk about all of these side effects, they have an accumulated burden that if you're talking about hip replacements or lung transplant, uh, that's a burden on the system. That's just not sustainable. If we can address something early on, then we truly are improving 
uh, you know, the, the disease buck awareness bucket, the patient bucket, and also the economic burden. Uh, and then, you know, I, I think things will work out commercially um, if you actually, frankly, have a, a product that really, really improves outcomes. Uh, there's a reason why uh, the JD Power Index of biopharma companies are where they are. It's great. We work on a lot of great therapies. Let's also make sure they are clinically meaningful. And Dr. Krauser knows this. Plenty of drugs come on the market and probably looks at them and says, geez, I'm not sure, you know, yes, they got a p-value, but you know, is this really going to help it really be an important part of my toolkit? And Jessica will look at the drug and say, is this really changing my life? We need to be about those kinds of therapies. All right. And Dr. Krauser, uh, let me let me bring you back in here because you mentioned early that your goal always is to keep patients uh, on uh, prednisone for uh, as little time as possible. Uh, I appreciate your every other day uh, approach. That that wasn't mine. And I was taking 80 milligrams a day for months and months. And then it took over a year to wean me off of them. Um, but how do you know when it's time? And Jessica, I want you to come in behind him and say, um, and tell us uh, when you felt it was time to have that conversation with your doctor to, to try something else and how difficult that was. But Dr. Krauser, you first, um, you know, how, how do you know when it's time and how do, you, how do you go to something else when there aren't many other therapies and things like methotrexate aren't much more pleasant? Well, that's a great question. I mean, it's a challenge. So one of the things I do initially is I think people are generally over-treated with immune suppression and by with steroids in particular. Uh, so we need, you know, better biomarkers to know, okay, the inflammation is gone or we can back off a little bit. Cause I always tell my patients initially, there's a lot of inflammation in the body. It takes envision a, a, a bonfire burning in the, in the woods and you're trying to put it out. You got to get buckets of water, but you come the next day and it's just sizzling. Your little cup of water will do. So, the, during the first phase, the steroids kind of are the bucket, in my view, uh, and, and they they they're very effective. But I don't want to use them more than once. I want to use them in a, up front, and I actually, in some people with cardiac, neuro, uh, and even some with very bad lung disease, I'll fold in the the um, steroid sparing agent right off the bat, so that it's starting to work, such that after the steroid, the initial steroid burst is given then we can back off very quickly. And they can mostly be on this steroid sparing agent and a very little steroids, usually within three months. Um, I can get them down to a very low dose of steroids. They're on methotrexate. They might be on azathioprine or mycophenolate or some of the, one of those things. If that fails, I don't give up. I'll, I'll escalate to the biologics like anti-TNF therapies, et cetera. But that's about all we got now. We need more options in the middle. Uh, and the other thing I would, I would like to say, I know this is a tangent, but I wanted to come back to appreciate why it's so important that ATIRE is doing research in this field, in this area. I, when I go to uh, insurance companies and, and, and ask for them to pay for the drugs I'm administering to my patients, they say, well, where's the evidence? You know, they, there, there's nothing, there's not many things FDA approved for sarcoidosis, so they can always use that as, a, as their reason not to approve the drug that is going to be steroid sparing. So if there is published evidence to suggest that, the, yep, this works, I hand that to them. And then they obligingly will, will help uh, me uh, treat you with a drug that is more effective or safer than steroids and equally effective. I would love someday to have a panel like this and I'll wear my journalism hat and, and have nothing but insurance people on. And I would give it to them <laughs> because it is so it difficult. It is so difficult. And then after a year, they want you to go through it again. And then now you're behind on your medication. And I one time I had a flare because I had a gap while I was waiting for approval. And boom, I'm in the hospital. Um, it's, 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 just, it's just wrong. Jessica, uh, come on back in. How hard was it for you to, to get to something that wasn't prednisone? So it was a challenge, um, not for me to convince my doctor to try something different. Ironically, it was a challenge for my doctor to convince me to actually try something different. Yes, 
Um, the reason why I say that, you know, you heard the long list of side effects I endured, and you're talking about a two-year time span, not just a few months, but two years. And I had a five-year-old daughter. I had a three-month-old son. You know, I was married. And the side effects just got to the point, John, where I did not want to live. I had nothing to look for, nothing to hope for. I had no answers. I had so many questions. And the only thing that I was being treated with that time was prednisone. And for that reason, I stopped. And you know, we've heard here, and we've heard Dr. Krauser and Dr. Shukla say, it's bad to stop your prednisone abruptly. I knew that, but I didn't care. I just didn't want to fight anymore. I feel like this was the end of my life. And I literally stopped my medications five times. And each time I stopped my medication, not only was I back at my doctor's office, but I was sicker and he became more apathetic. And the day that I had my enlightening moment was when my neurologist walked over to my exam table. He placed his hand on my arm and he said, Jessica, listen to me, trust me. And those are some big words for a doctor to say. He said, trust me. You will not always be on prednisone. Take your medication. So when he said that to me, the light bulb came on and I realized, okay, one, he cares. Two, I have hope. So I went from being a passive patient to being an active patient, meaning I asked him questions. Okay, you're telling me I'm not gonna always be on prednisone. What's the next step? What will the future look like? What's the next medication? How can we keep an eye, a close eye on the neural sark so that I will not have to go back on prednisone? You know, what are the other side effects I have to look, to look out for on prednisone? Because I had so many questions. So this is why we need more treatment options for sarcoidosis. Because I know I'm not speaking for myself when patients out there, sarcoidosis patients feel like this is the end of my rope. I have nothing to look forward to. My goals and dreams, they were out the window. But when I made that conscious decision to fight sarcoidosis and to restore my dreams and my goals, this is where I am today. Well, I tell you, you've had, uh, you've had a, a tough situation there. And, and you know, we've talked about what can we do to combat the side effects. Uh, and we talked about diet and other medications and so forth. But um, so many people that I've talked to on the podcast have talked about how valuable uh, therapy was to them, like going and, and seeing a psychologist or social sociologist. Did you, did you go through therapy? Did that help? I went through several therapists. Yeah, I did too. And they just had the same questions I had, you know, okay, we can try this, Jessica, um, but what's next? And I tried those things. If I felt like this therapist was not helping me, I went to another therapist. And it just became so overwhelming, John. Um, it was just, it was very overwhelming. It was a dark, dark time for me. I can, well, I can sympathize with your will to live. Um, mm -hmm. I, was, I would never say that, for instance, I was suicidal, but I was, mm -hmm. I was just kind of like, whatever. Yeah. You know, just whatever. Um, whatever happens, happens. And, and I, you know, I probably by most people's uh, account would, you know, say I have a wonderful life with three kids and a loving wife and now five grandchildren and had a lot to live for, did not care just wow. what just over it. And, that, and it was the prednisone. It really was. So listen, we're, we've got about seven minutes left here. Um, I want to start with Dr. Krauser and say, and just, and we're going to have a closing statement, but just, just briefly address, should we, should we continue to administer prednisone? Or, or is there a way to just not do it? Well, I like the poison analogy. So I'll, I'll, I'll stick with that. I, I, I think it's a necessary evil at times. Uh, there is nothing that works quite as fast and reliably in an acute setting. Um, and there's some synergy, I have to say, between pre prednisone, for instance, and say methotrexate. There are some people, I can't get them off the prednisone or they'll flare but I can keep them on a very, very small dose of prednisone with say another you know, steroid sparing agent. And that synergy is there and the side effects are lower at least. We have, we're accepting a lower. This gets into why we need new options. Some, there are some people that just can't come off of them as hard as I try to. I want to, but I can't do it. 
even with right. the, these stronger anti TNF molecules, sometimes you need to be on something else along with them, or they'll start to reject the antibodies that are right. The, the, so there is a, a space for new things. But again, I would emphasize that, that I'm very highly motivated to get them on the lowest possible dose. And I try to get them off and, and see if they can tolerate being off and on and right. onto something else. Any doctors who are listening now, any physicians, you know, I hope that they're they're heeding that uh, that advice because you've got a lot of experience with this, Doctor Shukla. How are you working with FSR right now, and uh, and how maybe can we get to a point where it's not prednisone? Well, the FSR has been instrumental to um, our program um, from the standpoint of of learning about the disease. So, you know, we, we're a company that um, we practice a lot of corporate humility. We don't come in with our own ideas early on in the program. This program was designed by, uh, and, and Elliot was involved early on, where we just said, look, here's a show and tell on what we have here. Where should we go? What should a protocol look like? What's really meaningful to, for you to believe a drug is working? It's part of the reason why we're one of the first uh, groups to really approach a steroid sparing type of protocol uh, with with uh, with uh, this opportunity. Uh, next is access to patients like Jessica, learning what is really meaningful uh, to change their quality of life. What are the fears they have around you know avoiding the serious outcomes? Um, uh, and then lastly, even just from a technical operations standpoint, the FSR helped us recruit patients. Um, the FSR is going to be instrumental in helping ATIRE and hopefully five other eight tires that get into the space in educating, guiding, uh, pushing regulators, uh, and, and really highlighting the need. Uh, and in some cases, maybe even helping us find patients um, uh, at, at the centers that, uh, that they, they actually uh, work with. So uh, it's been a great relationship. Uh, and I think it's been one of the most important relationships uh, for us at ATIRE. Mary, before we get to closing comments, would you just want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, how important that relationship is? Yeah, so it, the um, relationship with ATAR is really important. Um, and again, today I think is witness to that. Um, their company is just so uh, entrenched in this with us. Um, and uh, we need to be working with companies like ATAR to move the needle forward on this. I mean, you know, part of the biggest problem is that there's no incentive for alternative indications, right? And so we need to be applying pressure. We need to keep the, the, uh, the steam boiling over, if you will. Um, we need to, as you know, uh, FSR has a wonderful registry, right? Where we need to continue to uh, track and learn does, uh, disease burden and report that uh, to uh, government officials and just keep the pressure on um, to make sure that uh, there are incentives uh, for alternatives um, and that there are others uh, who are uh, in this space uh, to do something about this, this real significant uh, issue um, for sarcoidosis patients. Uh, and, uh, and we won't stop you know, until uh, we get there. Um, we are committed to this and uh, we know ATIRE is. And uh, for that, we are so very grateful for this extraordinary uh, partnership. So thank you, John, for that question. Sure, thank you. Jessica, in about 30 seconds, what would you like people to take away from today's session? So from today's session, um, we are one step closer to better treatment options for us sarcoidosis patients. And to the sarcoidosis patients that are under the sound of my um, to the sound of my voice, I implore each of you to keep advocating, keep fighting, don't give up. Ask the questions, ask your providers for better treatment options and for improved access to care. Thank Very you. Very good. All right, Dr. Krauser, about thirty seconds. What would you like people to take away? I, I would like to people to take away a, a sense of hope, because as putting on my hat as the scientific advisory board chair for FSR. I want to, to see us provide easy access to companies like Dr. Shukla, ATIRE to come in, test their products, get access to patients. More will come. And if we have success and, and new therapeutics are developed, the NIH starts to fund you more. Uh, the FDA is more happy with you. Other companies, I think this is a place we can make money. We're right at the edge right now. We're starting to develop models that actually 
the model the disease in the lab, and we're starting to find new therapeutic targets, et cetera. So I will leave you with that, that hope that we will replace steroids with other new, better agents. Very good. And Dr. Shukla, in 30 seconds, what would you like people to take away? I'd like people to take away that uh, patient organizations, experts, uh, they have a lot of power. They have a lot of power to, to um, uh, partner and sway regulators, companies, uh, uh, demand better, demand better from, from, from companies. Um, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like to see more companies uh, take our approach, really listen closely to the experts, listen to the patients, design drugs and trials that really meaningfully change not only what Jessica goes through, what Elliot has to practice every day. Um, uh, let's not create more burden in the process. Let's really make better therapies so that all of us here can look at this and say, this really changed uh, the dynamic uh, you know, for, for this condition. And Mary, do you want to give us a, a final 20,000 foot view of what FSR is doing? Well, again, I, I uh, ditto uh, Dr. Uh, Krauser with uh, hope. Uh, you know, we want everybody to leave today with hope. We are there. Everybody here on this panel is really working on this and advocating for this and doing what we can do. Please join us um, in that fight, in that effort. Share your stories with us. Be in touch with us. Um, and uh, it really does, uh, you know, make a difference in sharing stories and uh, really keeping this front and center. So um, we are all working on it. Uh, you have our uh, commitment on that. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Greatly appreciate it. And again, our sincere thanks to ATIR um, for the extraordinary work partnership. We're, we're very grateful. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Mary, for all you do. You, you, you haven't even been on board, I don't think, for a year yet. And already we're seeing amazing progress. And, uh, and we appreciate your leadership as well. Uh, it's, an, it's an honor to, to be a volunteer for the group and, and maybe eventually be a, a part of the solution at some point. So uh, and thank you to Dr. Krauser and to Jessica Reed and to Dr. Shukla as well for joining us here today. And, and all of you in the audience, thank you for taking the time to tune in as well. Uh, I do want you to remember to please complete the post-event evaluation and to let you know a recording of the town hall will be available on the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research YouTube channel and will also air the audio portion of this on the Sark Fighter podcast, which is now available on all the major podcast streaming platforms, including Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, pretty much any place that you uh, would listen to a podcast. Sark Warriors and their loved ones can look forward to uh, new episodes uh, of the podcast, whether we're talking to patients about their stories or medical researchers. Dr. Shukla has been on the podcast as well before, um, and, and we uh, just look forward to helping to uh, get the word out via the podcast. And then I will mention that you, if you want to learn more about ATIRE and the clinical trial they're conducting, and to learn more about sarcoidosis, where to get support and to join the fight, please visit www.stopsarcoidosis.org. And there will be, while you're there, please consider a donation to help FSR continue to provide important educational events like this one and to support FSR's research as we search for a cure for sarcoidosis. And we made one tiny small step with that here today through our panel discussion and through those of you who've joined us in the audience. So thank you once again for joining us and we'll see you next time.